Hey guys, it's Chris Bercher with Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. Thanks for coming back, or if you're new, welcome. Uh, I hope I uh, have some medicine to help you treat your curiosity. That's why I'm here for Curious Minds, and I appreciate you being curious. We need more of that. Um, and let's connect. You know, reach out to me uh, from my homepage, www.chrisbercher.com. You can find me on YouTube, make some comments on my video, Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. You can find my podcast versions of these same um, videos on all the uh, major podcast um, feeds, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all that good stuff. And again, I appreciate you coming. I just want to say, first of all, I had the honor, today is, uh, I don't even know, November 17th or something like that, the honor of being on the podcast of the great DJ Doran out of Chicago. And uh, you can find that if you want to go uh, check out the conversation that we had. It was a wonderful opportunity, and uh, he um, it's proven to be a real mentor to me. Well, you know, in, in that in that one hour meeting, uh, and he really um, sort of reminded me how important it is for us to be curious. And I'm sort of you know trying to incorporate a little bit more of that into what I'm doing because I think that's you know that's the itch I'm trying to scratch. And uh, I know there are a lot of us out there that just have naturally curious minds, and um, we need to feed that and uh, keep our minds open and keep thinking. And you can find that if you Google DJ Doran, D-O-R-A-N. He's all over the place. Great dude. And um, speaking of which, um, I, it has inspired me um, to the extent that I plan in the near future to do a whole interview series on KEW. And hopefully DJ can uh, make some time and he and I can continue our conversation and, um, you know, interview some of my heroes or some of the people that I follow, some of my favorite podcasters, if, they, if they'll agree to do it, <laughs> uh, and do a little series on curiosity and what that is and why it's important and what makes us... Um, what makes some people curious, what makes some people not curious, and how do we nurture it, and that kind of thing. So look for that in the future. I'm saying it out loud here to hold myself accountable for doing it. So this is episode 30, something like seven months worth of this, and I, um, I just thought of this on the car about 30 minutes ago, that uh, I wanted to address the concept of quality. So welcome to Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom, episode 30, Quality. The idea of quality came to me when I read a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And I read this book before I was an adult, uh, probably 17 or 18 years old. And it's about a guy who rides a BMW motorcycle across the country with his son. His son's name's Chris. And, uh, you know, my dad rode a BMW motorcycle. It had, a, it had special meaning to me. Uh, motorcycle is always a part of my dad's life, my brother's life, and I had my short time experience with a motorcycle. And that's what attracted me to the book. But later I would find out that it is known as the best-selling philosophy book in the world. <laughs> it's written by a guy named Robert M. Persig, P-I-R-S-I-G. I think I have the middle initial right. And he's only written one other book. It was written in 1974. It's almost as old as me. And it's a wonderful read. And I find that People who have heard of the book, read the book, we all get something completely different out of it. And I think that's what makes it such a wonderful philosophy book or, you know, because I don't think Persig wrote it, you know, to be philosophical. It just happens to be, which is crazy, you know, that <laughs> the, the, the audience found it philosophical to the point where it's the best-selling philosophy. But that may be outdated, but the best-selling book about philosophy or philosophical book um, and it really wasn't the intention of the book. It's not like Socrates's, you know, speeches is the best-selling philosophy book. But what I got out of the book is the idea of quality. And my sort of take on the book is that it's about a guy who literally goes crazy to the point where he has to get uh, shock therapy because he tries to define what quality is. And it's about a whole lot of other things, but that's what I got out of the book. And there's a quote in the book, and I'll read it to you off my phone because that's what we do, that says... And what is good, Phaedrus, and what is not good, need we ask anyone to tell us these things? And Phaedrus is sort of the name for his past self, and it's also uh, a big philosophy person from, I guess, the Greek era. <clears throat> what Need we need, uh, have anyone tell us 
what is good and what is not good. Don't we sort of just know it? And so my take on quality is, you know, we we don't, it's like porn, (laughs) you know, you don't know what it is until you see it. So as a, as a thought experiment, you know, maybe even pause the video right here uh, or the audio and take a break and see if you can define what quality is and what makes one thing better than another thing, you know, whether it's a car or a house or a shirt or shoes or a phone, um, and kind of going back to episode one, uh, facts, see if you can f- tease apart what are the inherent qualities about the item, qualities, the inherent characteristics of the item that give it quality uh, versus what are your opinions or thoughts or ideas about what gives that item quality. And really, this whole idea of quality gets us closer to the truth because it's sort of separating ourselves from the object or the the thought or the noun, you know, whatever it is, person, place, or thing. And so, you know, if you haven't read Zen and Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, I highly recommend it. You you know, you can get the paperback version for five bucks, use copies all over the place on Amazon just because it is such a popular book and see what you get out of it. And you might even, you know, most of the people I talk to are like, I didn't, I missed the quality thing. I don't know what you're talking about, but that's what I got out of it. And it's still something that I ponder and I was thinking about it in the car and it's like, it's time to do a podcast about this. So, you know, you can, I, I mentioned a few things. It's like a phone. What do we all have? Phone. Let's try to take that and do a little thought experiment on that. What makes an iPhone better than an uh, Android phone, or what makes more specifically like the iPhone 12, you know, better than, an, uh, I don't even know what the comparable, you got a whole bunch of choices. They're all about the same price. You know, is there inherent characteristics, features, um, things it can do that makes one phone better than another? I think you'll find Initially, you might be able to say, well, yeah, this has got an aluminum case, and this one's got a faster processor. This one has more memory. This one has a brighter screen. This one has more pixels in the display. Yeah, all of those things are are probably true. But what if someone's looking at getting a phone just because they want, for example, a really good earpiece so that they can actually hear people? I can't even – I've got an iPhone 8 Plus. It's a good phone. It was probably you know, an $800 phone when it came out. I can't hear crap when somebody calls me. I have to put the phone on speaker in order to hear the person I'm talking to. My old flip phone from, you know, 2005 uh, uh, is way better, has much higher quality when it comes to hearing someone on the other end that you're talking to. Hands down, no comparison. If that was the single, you know, metric that you were rating those things on, the iPhone would get an F and that old $40 uh, flip the flip phone would get an A plus, you know. And how do you go down the list? Do you have to do a comprehensive analysis and then score everything. And then how do you score it? And then what, make sure you get all the categories. And not all those things are important to everybody. When it comes down to it, I think at first you'll be able to list off a whole bunch of different things and say, you know, this is this is better because of this and this and this. And then as you sort of com- continue to populate that list and you talk to a whole bunch of other people who have different needs or or different desires from that thing, you'll find that eventually you get to a point where um, it becomes an opinion. It just becomes what you like better. And so related to truth, can we all have our separate opinions about something and have these things sort of add up to some level of quality? Maybe, maybe if you interviewed every single person in the world that has a phone about all of their different opinions about a particular phone, and then you take some average of all of those things, and again, you measured every single person and every single phone and had them all represented, um, you might be able to come up with some real consensus based on that incredibly difficult and near impossible analysis and say, well, at the end of the day, all, this one has all the higher scores. And, that, and that's what you'll see. Say you're going to buy a new laptop. You know, you get on the internet and you, maybe you go to Amazon and you look at all people's opinions, the ratings, and you get all 10 laptops that all got like 4.8 and up out of five. And then you look at all these things and there's probably going to be things on that list where you're like, well, I don't want that. It's way out of my budget. Or I don't want that. It's way too small. Or I I can't have that. So there's, you know, it's hard to tell because everybody wants something different out of that. And you're going to have to weed through all those things. 
um, and get to a point where you can make your own decision. Now, does your final purchase represent the highest quality item that's available? Of course not. It's the one that meets your needs the best. That doesn't mean it's any better than anything else. It's just the one that you ended up wanting. None of that has anything to do uh, with the overall you know, if you had to give it a single value for quality. Now, it may you may be able to break quality up into multiple parts and, and, and rate it on that and then only compare people who want a gaming com- computer and say, well, this is the best one because everybody who want, buys this kind of computer wants the same thing. They want speed and resolution and, and whatever. But, but that's not really quality. Um, it's still, in some context, an opinion. It's just it's it's a list of features that happen to appeal to a certain range of buyers, and if you narrow it down, you know you've eliminated ninety percent of what this thing is. You know, you, it's a very small subset of laptop or a very small subset of phone, and so in the context of all the phones, what does it even matter? What is it even worth? And we get so obsessed. With these things, and it's sort of you, you bring in analysis paralysis. You know, I can, I can analyze and and try to tease apart all these different features that add up to quality infinitely, and never make a decision. Um, you you get the fear of missing out. I've got to have the best one because I want to be seen as being a smart consumer that buys something of incredible quality. Um, it becomes this game that we start to apply to everything. It, you know, reading a menu at a restaurant. This is the most important meal of my life. I have to get the right thing. What's the highest quality on this menu that I can buy? Is it the most expensive item? You know, is it the healthiest item? Um, is it the item that comes with the most mass? <laughs> you know, because are you getting more v- value? And we'll talk, I think we'll get to value. I think at the end of this is, um, you know, the the ratio or, or or the relationship between the individual consumer. And the apparent quality to that consumer of an item is essentially value. You know, am I getting the most for my money for what I need? But then this is something that's supposed to exist in the world without us. You know, quality has this connotation or this definition that says this thing is better. It's not about what you think. It just is. Um, and, and so that's, that's like the truth, right? It's a, it's a good kind of analog uh, or metaphor for the truth, if this thing actually is better, well, that goes beyond opinion. That goes beyond an argument. You know, it just, it, it is number one. And because of this one, but you know, pick any of that, pick anything. Can you definitively say it has higher quality uh, than something else? Um, you know, what's another sort of, you know, for me, it's like mandolins, random example. You know, what's the best wooden built instrument, acoustic instrument, uh, available. Well, (laughs) you, (laughs) in order to answer that question, believe me, because this is, this is one of those things, one of those rabbit holes I allow myself to go down and do it. It's a hobby. I love, and what I've learned is you got to play every one. You can't just say, you know, Collings model, um, the varnish, whatever, top of the line, you know, you can go to the store and buy that, and it's going to be the best mandolin that you can possibly buy. You, you, you pretty much have to take them one by one. So in order to really answer that question, it's, you can't use statistics. You know, you can't use a representative sample. You, you, you can, but that's only going to give you an idea about which one is the best, which one has the highest quality. Um, first you have to list everything that anybody that's ever touched a mandolin or will touch a mandolin believes to be a feature that matters. You got to have that comprehensive, hundred percent complete list of things that you can evaluate, right? Um, then you have to go to each individual instrument that has ever existed up until this point, And ideally all the ones that will ever exist in the future and evaluate all of those features for each instrument. And you have to do that in such a way that as you move from instrument to instrument, the evaluator doesn't change. I mean, that's, you can't get there. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. I don't need to beat that horse anymore. That's how hard it is. It isn't like statistics where you can estimate the quality and you, and we do this, I guess, certainly we can do this, but I'm just making the point that 
Um, sorry, might be the first time I've ever had a dean while I'm recording. Um, the the you you could have some proxy of quality, right? And that's what we do. You know, we we have this idea that this brand or this model or this year of something is generally speaking based on an evaluation of a handful or even, you know, many of these particular vintages of whatever it is have delivered a level of quality to their purchasers like in reviews. You know, you you you, you know, I'm going to buy a light bulb for my car, which I, I just did. And you'll find that there are hundreds of manufacturers of that light bulb and the prices can vary all over the place. And there's lots of reviews. It's the only way you can really assess, begin to even get an estimate of that quality is by how dissatisfied or satisfied people have been. So you look at reviews and you go, well, yeah, most people seem to have bought this one. And there's very few complaints. Maybe that one guy got one and he didn't like and it didn't work or whatever. But, you know, if, if I went through and looked at all hundred of them and looked at all the reviews and um and you can't just look at numbers because maybe one of them only had one dude review it and he had a really good experience and he gave it a five and this one's got 400 reviews but it's only a 4.5 but you know wouldn't you think that the more people that throw their opinions out there the of course you're going to get some bad ones one is just not enough i mean it really does sort of pull in all of these things truths and facts and science and statistics and averages and opinions and ideas and thoughts and you know personal bias all of these things feed into this thing that we do every day we 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 assess the quality of something you know almost instantaneously and the only problem i have with any of this is we confuse our individual um, demarcation or allotment of value or quality to some thing as being <laughs> meaningful, <laughs> not even meaningful, but we sort of think we're right. Again, it goes back to what from Paul says, we all think we're right about something. It's like, oh yeah, iPhones are better than Android. Duh. Okay. Based on what now? Yeah. And that's what I'm asking you to do as an exercise. Think about something. Think about the TV you, you spent Six weeks, you know, last year on Black Friday, analyzing which one you were going to buy. Are you really convinced that you got the best TV they make? You know, um, and so uh, I'll go ahead and go there now. But um, you know, the the value is really, I think, most of the time what we're talking about because we want to feel like we most of these things I'm talking about. You're going to buy, or you're going to work toward, or you're going to spend some energy, whether that's or resource that you, limited resource that you have, whether it's money or time or attention on this thing, and you want the payback to be commensurate with whatever. You know, like socks. Well, number one, I'll share a little secret with you. If I was super wealthy and um, didn't have any concern for the environment or anything like that, I would wear a different pair of socks every day, and then I'd throw them away. Just, they would be disposable. You know, I just love the feel of a fresh new pair of socks. Having said that, there's a whole continuum of socks and some feel really good some wear really good some make it through the wash pretty good some don't get you know their elasticity lasts you know for a long time i mean there's a whole bunch of different features of socks that go into play that i could overanalyze infinitely and never ever buy a pair and go around barefoot all the time but if i'm going to buy some socks i am literally not going to think about it i'm going to go what's the cheapest ones 12 for five bucks um that's me and having done that fairly recently, I quickly realized, ooh, how disappointing. These things are kind of like tissue paper. <laughs> but they serve their purpose. They absorb the sweat. <laughs> it keeps that on my shoes. It's more, you know, makes that more comfortable. Uh, whatever. But you, you know, so that's, I guess my point is something like that doesn't really matter. I'm not really, I'm going to skip the quality assessment. I'm just going to go for cheap. And then there's that whole continuum. And now maybe I'm going to buy a wedding ring or an engagement ring something that I perceive to have meaning and longevity and, you know, all these things. It has to be expensive or at least appear that way because that reflects how much I love this person. Uh, or maybe um, you're thinking about, like, the heating system for your home uh, and you live in a particularly cold environment or something where you, you want this thing to be reliable. You know, you want it to be good. Um, or maybe you're talking about a car, you know, that you, you need to fit your family and needs to get good gas mileage and, you know, the, the, the value thing because your, your resources are so limited. You know, you have a different purpose 
for it. And so right there, like with the cars, you know, the quality of a race car, like a sports car you may buy, is a completely different set of criteria than analyzing a work vehicle or like a... um, you know, a a transportation vehicle, they're going to have a completely different set of rules. But how do you then say, what's the best vehicle? Or even what's the best brand of vehicle? You know, for me, it might be reliability, um, depreciation, so I can find a four-year-old one, you know, that's just like a new car, but it's a lot cheaper, or maybe resale value. Or, Or for another person, it might be, you know, which one do most people associate with rich people? or um, has the best radio, or comes with an engine block heater because I live in Wisconsin. You know, all, you, there's something about that variability and relationship with the end user or the consumer that interferes with the basic question going back to the beginning of what quality is. I'm talking about standalone, without anybody's input. No attention being paid to it. What makes one thing better than another? And of course, you can't say, well, what's better, this boat or this egg? <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm talking about. It has to be you know, a ranking system among similar enough things. Um, and I think those groups should be big and general, but they also can't be as absurd. You know, you wouldn't include an egg in a boat category. I mean, I can't think of any any time that you would do that. Um, building materials, you know, the best nails to hold up a wall. Who cares, you know? But if somebody, you know, maybe somebody does care, and certainly they do. So um, this is a very complex thing. And again, this is maybe this is part of my point. It's a very complex word that we oversimplify on a daily basis. Um, Infinitely, almost. And so let's just take some time and think about this, but not to the degree that Persig's character in Zen of the Art of Motor- Motorcycle Maintenance did. I don't want any of you to have to, to drive yourself crazy thinking about this. You could, but part of being curious is imposing limitations. You know, one of the big things I realized when I was young and getting into philosophy is I felt like I was always going full circle and just spinning around and never making any decisions, never coming to any conclusions. Um, But what I realized is there is no end. That's not a loop. It's a squiggly line through space that doesn't even know it had a beginning or it doesn't have a beginning or an end. It's a process and a path. And the point is to enjoy the journey because it modifies your thinking and it helps your mind grow and it feeds your soul and all these other things. I, I was erroneously looking for some sort of point to the whole thing or some sort of conclusion or some sort of like a applied um, benefit to the world. And really the benefit is just in the doing. It's not in the a finished product. And, and, and so that's the point of, of many of these journeys and certainly the, the quality journey. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe I'm kind of all over the place here. So I'm going to pick something that is near and dear to my heart and, and, and really for me was a heavy exercise of quality um, Thinking, you thinking about what quality means because it meant a lot to me in the context of what I think uh, Persig meant in his book. And that is beer. What makes a beer good? What makes a beer better than another beer? As a brewery owner, and really as a, as a, a pretty severe <laughs> beer hobbyist, not so much now, but certainly at one point, I mean, I was really into it. And, and, and it was, you know, with good reason, because my understanding of beer and, and people's tastes and quality and what makes one better than the other was critical to, I thought, my business model. And the more I understood this, this, what made beer good, the more likely I would be to make good beer. And if there is a relationship between, I guess, sales or consumption and quality, then by having the best quality, you ought to have the best sales. And that's a whole nother podcast because I don't think that's true at all. <laughs> uh, that, that you know, people can recognize quality and that quality actually does result in, you know, the ops, ob, then all the other competitors or other options becoming obsolete, right? That doesn't happen. There's not one car. 
You know, if quality was the driver of consumption, we wouldn't have so many freaking choices. And really, maybe the choices have complicated this quality thing. But okay, let's go to beer. You know, when you're making beer and you're trying to make good beer, right there, good. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm introducing a, 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 an analytic that is um, about the quality of that beer, right? I'm not talking about an opinion. I'm not, because <laughs> plenty of people I know think crappy beer is good. They think it's high quality. They confuse them liking it with it being good. And what I found in this is that that is most often not the case, right? Cheap American beer, and no, no offense to any of these manufacturers because, in fact, I don't even, you know, they would argue with me because their advertising suggests that they think it's good. But they, only, they just do that because they want you to think that. I think behind closed doors, natural light, the natural light people would be like, yeah, we know it's not very good, but we just we want to sell it. And um, so we're going to tell people it's good. So that's a whole other marketing and, and, and all that is a separate <laughs> conversation. But what makes a beer good versus what makes a beer not good is outside the realm of consumerism. It's outside. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with humans. It's just like facts. The truth exists without us. Quality exists without us. You know, when we start to get us involved, then it just becomes a matter of what do you like better? What do you prefer? Those are not the same thing. What's the best-selling beer in the world? Oh, it must be the best beer. No, not at all. I don't know where we thought that or, you know, if that was the intent of marketing. It's just, it's not the truth. Okay, so I quickly learned that the best-selling beers, the most popular beers, were often not very good. I mean, they're good for what they are. They're fine. They're fine. They're kind of middle of the road to good. They're not excellent, you know? And, and, and there's a difference between excellent and very good and good, and passing, and fair. You know, there, there's a continuum of quality assessment words, metrics that we can use to sort of measure. You can put it in the scale of 1 to 10, you know, percentages, uh, decimal points, terminology, whatever. But, you know, anybody can sit down and, and sort of rank things. You can sit down and blindly try 10 beers and put them in some order of what you like. If you have no training or skill set or have never thought about that before, it's really just a random, I mean, it's not even a random idea of your opinions because you haven't, you know, taken into account the fact that your taste changes with each one that you drink. So you might like the first one best, but that was because you were thirsty. And by the last one, you're tired of it. And you're not going to like anything. If you don't know that, you don't have an ability to control for that. It's just a, it's just a crapshoot. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it it has no value. And that there is the reality of tasting beer is that it is not only muddied by opinion and opinion by not even amateurs, but people that have no standardized approach in assessing the quality, but yet acting like an expert and assigning some quality terminology disguised as, uh, as a, but as an opinion. And so that's what you get. You get all these opinions that have zero, well, maybe some, I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm just pointing out a truth, an actuality, that most of the people that offer an opinion have zero credentials um, to offer that opinion. I've drank beer my whole life. You know, well, so did you drink it in a way that, you know, where you were assessing the quality of it or you were drinking in a way that just said you liked it, which brings in a whole, whole, a hundred percent bias. You know, your dad liked it. It was cheap. You like the can. There's naked girls in the commercials. I mean, all those things you can't, it, without some intense, intentional effort to tease those things apart. And you know, it's a, it's a joke, and I, and I'm just as guilty, just as guilty. The beers that I like now, a big part of why I love Sierra Nevada is the philosophical ethos of the owner and the company. It doesn't have anything to do with the beer. I mean, sure, it may translate indirectly to because they feel this way, they you know 
their beer. They make good beer, but it's still just good. And so what makes a good beer, and the, the punchline, is the ingredients that go into it, the methodology, the equipment, the attention, the skill set. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of measurable things. But let's just go to ingredients. How are you going to choose which is the best barley? Which barley has the highest quality? Oh, man, it's the same thing all over again. Except you don't have, it's not as muddied by consumers because you don't have a lot of consumers directly consuming barley and having these um, emotional opinions about it. You don't have that. It's not a thing. Um, there are measures of, you know, how much sugar it has, the moisture content, you know, the company ethos, and all these other things. But but among breweries and brewers, home brewers anyway, and brewers, there is some opinions about who makes the best barley. And a lot of those, you know, are quantifiable, measurable, um, you know, accessible with a minimal amount of bias, but they're kind of meaningless, like moisture content. I mean, what does that mean? I, what does that do for the quality? Um, you know, it may have better storage, you know. It may have more sugar yield per current per weight. Um, it may um, be less influenced by water quality parameters, be more robust, you know, more flexible, but maybe somebody doesn't care about that. Uh, even even from a brewer's perspective. So it's the same thing, the same trap, the same shock therapy <laughs> inducing analysis with each of the ingredients. So, I mean, that's a that's a wash. What makes one hop better than another? For me, it's uh, freshness. But that, you can't really fault a hop for that. You know, if I can get it fresh, it's going to have better properties that I'm looking for, Ar- aroma, flavor, less so bitterness. Um, but but anyway, it, it's, it's the same exact um, impossibility to assess the quality of ingredients. So you, you can say that, but it's the same trap. You haven't got, you haven't improved the analysis any. Um, and then there's brewing techniques, which you can assess. You can sort of say uh, how long is the mash. Uh, what temperature are you resting these things at? These are all going to have an effect on the final product, but that's a little bit sketchy because that f- those effects may be result in beers that you prefer um, and beers that somebody else doesn't prefer, and different techniques in the brewing process may result in different results that you don't prefer and somebody else does prefer. So that's another sort of tr- opinion trap um, but then at the very coarse level, you can sort of say there are brewing techniques and ingredients that are bad, <laughs> you know, that you have to do, you have to adhere to a, a, a set of rules that is within some field of parameters that's less than, you know, the realm of possibilities. So you could make beer by, you know, having a cat pee on barley and it ferments and it's beer because you made it from barley and there's water and urine that you, we could all agree that's going to be bad. Nobody's going to like, well, maybe it's awesome. We just, we not, we'll never know, but compared to the, what we know about beer and what we call beer, it's not going to be very good. Okay. So, but the, but so there is some subset of the realm of possibilities about how there is, how you can make beer and with what ingredients that is, uh, that's better <laughs> than all the other ways. But that's pretty much what you see. You don't see, you don't get beers on the shelf that have been made outside this, you know, fairly narrow range of of ingredients, equipment, techniques, um, um, and then freshness. You know, fresh beer is better for the most part. Some sometimes storing beer over time can improve uh, the flavors, but really only to a small subset of beers. For the most part, you want to drink them fresh, but. Is that inherent to the product? No, that's not really, you know, that's a, my, um, uh, well, actually, that's probably a element of quality that's easy to assess. This beer's a week old. It's an IPA. The hops are still popping. You know, it, it's going to more resemble the intent of the brewer than a beer, the same beer or a very similar beer that's six months old. It just is. And so freshness might be an element of quality and that one that you can actually control quite easily. The problem is people don't know that. They might get a beer on the shelf that's an awesome beer, um, whatever that means. 
but it's six months old and it's really past its prime. And the sample that they are going to taste is 70% of, of, of what it should be simply because it's oxidized, it's aged, you know, the uh, volatile compounds have, have changed to the point where you don't get the flavor uh, or the aroma or whatever it is um, that you, sh- you should have gotten, that the brewer intended uh, for you to get. And so I'm, I'm not sure. That's a pretty sketchy one. Uh, but I guess there's a couple points here. One, the world of opinion is not a measure of quality. It's a measure of what people like. And that may actually correlate with the quality, but you, and, and it may be a decent tool for you to sort of screen things, right? But it's not measuring quality. It's sort of like um, a thermometer doesn't actually measure the amount of heat in something. It measures the temperature of something. That's an indirect measure of the quality of heat. It's, you know, that maybe that's, I can't explain that well enough to go beyond that, but it's a thing. Um, so for me, oh, and then there's the other thing. It's like, I remember one time I was going on a date with a girl and I actually made her cry. And I felt really bad about this. It's not my intention. She said, I wanted her to try a beer that I thought was really good. And she tried it and she was like, Ooh, that's gross. That's a terrible beer. And I was like, I think what you mean, and I was trying to be gentle. And this is when I discovered this. I said, I think what you mean is you don't like it because I really like it. And I know the brewery and I understand how this was made. And I know the age of the beer and and I, you know, I know the characteristics of what went into this. And I can tell you that it's a really good beer that, you know, meeting all of the elements of quality that I can assess that I think are fair to attribute to the beer, the brewery, the brewers, the ingredients, and all these other things that aren't really like opinions. Um, what you're telling me is the opposite of that. You're telling me a simple opinion. And that's fine. That has value. But it shouldn't measure. It's not a measure of the quality of the beer. It has nothing to do with it. Uh, and it's good. You, you, you know, And she, you know, and she was really like bold and assertive and strong and like, you know, she would have fought <laughs> over her opinion. And, and, and I think she didn't really love that part of her personality. And so when I called her out on it, it was more about that than it was about um, it being an opinion and not a measure of quality. So that was fine. But that really made me aware that, you know, people confuse these things and we, 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 we put um, weight and value and meaning into our ability to assess these things and for our opinions to be really close measures of quality. And really, who gives a shit? I don't understand why we, we, we get so strong about that. Like, I love the Falcons. Like, oh, they suck. You know, they're fighting over your football team favorite. It's like, I mean... Who's to say who's better? They've won more games, I guess. Maybe in maybe in sports, that's a measure of the quality of a team. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know. Someone else may measure that differently. I certainly think that's one element of it. But aren't there a whole lot more? And don't we have to? Well, we don't have to. But to really get at a definition and an understanding of something, if that was our goal, to understand what quality is, we really have to include a super holistic measure estimate of all of these different things that go into it to really definitively say this has more quality than that. And if you're not into that, maybe you just take the word quality and you throw it in the trash <laughs> and you never assess it again. But we don't do that. We don't say, well, I like it. That's my opinion. I think it's better. I don't really care. Nobody does that. They fight over the value of their opinion and how closely that approximates the actual quality of something. And that's where I have a problem. And I think it's important to make the distinction um, between opinion and, and direct measures of quality because it translates into so many other things like the truth and the fact and uh, and fact. And you can't have that. You can't do that. You can't. And we're doing it like mad right now. Your opinions do not supersede the truth. There are there are not alternate facts, right? And so that's why this quality thing is, is so important and why I get so excited about it. Um, did I really get the, you know, so to me, there's lots of good beers out there that I don't like, but it's so fun. Um, 
And I have the toolkit. You know, I have the assessment kit because I practiced. One, I understand how to taste beer. If you really want to taste beer and assess the quality of it, you, you can't know anything about it. And even that, you know, because we bring all of our... It's science, right? There's a science to it. And all that means is there's a standardized method that you have to follow to approach so that you apply it the same way every time you do it. Or every test that you do, every analysis that you do for beer to beer is a completely independent thing and, and you can't be consistent. And so the mood you're in, the, 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 the beauty, the, the, the attraction that you have to the people in the room, all those other things will feed into what you, you, at the end of the day, what you happen to say about this particular tasting of a beer. All of your experiences that collectively far outweigh anything that the beer has to offer are going to collectively interact to influence the, the score you know, this, that, that you give that beer. And so in order to really do this, you have to learn how to do it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I can, I can taste a beer that I don't like, like, um, you know, pastry stouts, these things that have like Oreos and they taste like a dessert, but not my thing, but I can sample one and take, you know, disassemble it in my head from the ingredient list, from the quality of the ingredients, the freshness of all the different ingredients, um, the yeast pitch health, you know, um, the techniques that went into, I can, I can do that because I've done it so much for, you know, for 10 years, 15 years. That's what I did. Um, that and a quarter will get you a hot cup of Jack squat, but you can't then come up next to me and go, that's gross. Or, Oh, it's the best beer in the world. Having none of that skill set or 1% or 10% of the skill set that I have and argue with me about what we're talking about, except to say that you like it or you don't like it. Um, but that's not what happens. In fact, there are all kinds of sites and just like the ratings on Amazon.com or, or whatever um, about your experiences with these things, they have value, but they're not a direct measure of quality. Um, and, at, and at the end of the day, not many people actually do that. And, and unfortunately, I mean, consumer reports magazine, maybe, you know, there are some, some people, some entities that, that try make a pretty decent effort at getting close to, uh, providing you the information. And at the end of the day, like I said, none of this matters except for the semantics of the meaning of a word. And as much as, uh, in as much as that can represent uh, a bigger argument about facts and truth, which is, I think, very important. Um, you know, it's fine. You'd make your, you draw your conclusions, you, you make a decision and you have an opinion and, and, and that's that. And you go about your day and you drive what car you drive and you have what phone you have. And, um, that's all well and good. It's, it's when you try to venture into a different realm, my realm, you <laughs> know, anybody's realm really that's welcome to it. But this stuff is important to me. And so, uh, you need to know the difference or we're going to, you know, we're going to have an argument and really we're not going to have an argument because you don't give a crap about what I'm talking about. If it's just somebody that says, you know, Fords are better than Chevy's, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight, but I can tell you 99 times out of a hundred, the person that says that has not done any anal analysis of real value in a discourse or an argument about the quality of those vehicles. It's all about this suite of other things. They like the way they smell. It's got a better radio. They come in cooler colors. Girls like him more when he drives this one or, or her or whatever. So some part of that, so we're really, you know, we're really sort of, what we're doing is we're taking quality, which is a thing. And it's really hard to measure. And, uh, you know, it has some degree of value or meaning or not, depending and we're pulling out this mess that people have put into the sphere of, of, of quality and called it something, you know, and called it called something else quality. That's all I'm saying. I think what we're really talking about is value. And value, well, so there's quality and then there's value and then there's probably like opinion way down here. Um, that all get at the relationship between the effort or the resources that you must spend to get something. Um, that is, that's a meaningful thing to everybody, you know, it brings into mind budgets and, um, um, satisfaction and happiness and all these other things. You know, when you buy a pair of shoes, 
lots of different people and they could be split up into subsets, but you know, every person has basically a unique deterministic set of deterministic metrics that they use when they decide what kind of shoes they want and then whether or not the price or the cost, whether in time or resources or time or money, um, is worth is commensurate with what they're going to get. And of course, that's an important thing. You know, value to me is a really important thing that matters to everybody because finances are limited and things cost money. I mean, it's capitalism. Uh, and, and that could go, we could argue about that all day long. Like I said, you could argue that every individual person in the world has a unique subset of metrics, uh, for every individual item that they may purchase or in any individual activity that they spend their time on that inherently changes their individual value in that individual transaction. Yeah. Um, And at the end of the day, how they talk about that is an opinion for the most part. Um, But there is a way to talk about that transaction that has to do with quality. And so for me, I'm really frugal about a lot of things. Socks. I am not going to blow high dollars on socks. I'm really not going to spend. I got the same pair of Nikes that were $30 on sale. I've had them for three years. And to me, to me, it's important to be able to, to say that. I, I spent 30 bucks on shoes in three years, $10 a year. Um, I have several pairs of shoes, like four. <laughs> but that's just not important to me. It's not important to me to have the coolest looking shoes that somebody else will be like, those shoes are cool or, or whatever. But that's fine. I'm not saying these Nikes are the highest quality shoes ever made by any... I'm not even counting that. It has nothing to do with it. They have lasted me three years. I think that's an important element of quality if we really wanted to get you know into it and start to think about why, what makes shoes quality to me. Um, you know, wearability costs, that's going to be different. But now for a mandolin or something that's important to me, a motorcycle, a computer, a phone, that's a whole different set of things. And my set of things is going to different from your set of things. And you may not even give a shit about some of the things that I own and not even want one and think it's a joke and you'd rather, you know, throw it away than, than, than have it around the house. Um, and, and that's fine. So there's, there's, there's that complicating factor. You know, who cares what the highest quality, by the, by the real meaning of the word quality, socks are out there. Probably not many people. Um, and so probably the, the best quality socks or the highest possible quality of socks probably don't even exist. Um, because why? <laughs> Although related to this, and it has a phrase, and maybe one of you guys can remind me of what this phrase is, or I'll have to ask my brother. He told me a story about how when the, the first incandescent light bulbs, commercial light bulbs were produced, mass produced, they had a tungsten filament that um, there are light bulbs from that vintage that are still burning. And so what the company said was, this isn't going to work. We need to make these light bulbs with a filament that burns out. And so people will buy more. Otherwise, everybody's going to buy one light bulb and that's the end of us. <laughs> and I forget what that terminology is, but, you know, so we were, we're up against that. <laughs> so consumerism and capitalism and, 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 and trade and, and um, um, for the free market inherently is going to reduce quality because you definitely don't want to people might not make products if you're only going to ever buy one of them because it lasts forever but but lasting forever might be a good measure of the quality of that item it's durable it's um long lasting it whatever or it may not you don't want the most durable chocolate bar <laughs> who cares i'm going to eat it right now <laughs> it doesn't matter if it you know, or or like a really good IPA that needs to be consumed fresh, but that has no shelf life. You know, um, that's not the point. You know, in fact, there's a whole submarket of beer that basically says you need to drink, buy this beer, and drink it in a week, or you're wasting your money. Which is a funny thing to do because most large commercial breweries are trying to make the most shelf stable product possible so they can ship it all out of the world. And it's, if it's been on the shelf six months, you're going to buy it and have the same experience. But these, this small niche of craft brewers has actually found an, a, a, a draw and accelerated market by making a very short lived thing because it creates this massive demand, um, for getting it because you only have a very narrow window. So it, 
you know, there, there aren't going to be any take home messages <laughs> besides the fact that what you think is quality, what most people think is quality is probably really just an opinion. And it's important for us to recognize that and, and maintain the credibility of the concept of quality isolated from that of opinion and just realize that these two things are very different. And just for fun, maybe, you know, ask yourself, I think it would certainly make a lot of us, um, uh, more budget minded. Maybe it might save some of us some money. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, in the world of capitalism and the free market, you're not going to get companies that really inform you about the quality of their products. They're going to tell you that their quality is the best. And then they're going to convince you to, to buy it for a whole, whole lot of other reasons, uh, which is, you know, if you've seen my marketing solicitation episode, you know my opinion about all that. <laughs> it makes me very um, suspicious because quality is important in many things in my life, and it's not important in some other things. But where it is important, it takes a lot of work to assess it. You know, I have I have some um, beneficial characteristics in my thinking, like being a trained scientist, being having a a um, a suspicious mind looking for people's agendas. You know, I can cut through a lot of these influential layers to try to get to the source uh, of quality when I'm really, uh, when, when I decide that it's really important for whatever relationship or product or experience that I'm trying to look for. Um, so yeah, hopefully none of you feel like you need to get a lobotomy uh, now, but this is a really fun topic that I think is, one of the things that suffers from the philosophical um, tail uh, biting scenario, but if you just let it be, it's a fun thought experiment. You know, the next time you're having your favorite wine. Oh, and incidentally, I mentioned this in other podcasts. There have been scientific pu- published papers about really expensive wine and really expensive scotch where they got experts and amateurs and they got a, you know, an assortment of prices uh, for these wines and liquors and they had people taste them and there was no relationship between the cost and the perceived quality. Uh, part of that might be just because these people didn't have the experience. Maybe if they got all sommeliers and, you know, experts to do this, uh, and I, maybe they did, I don't know. But the point is, you know, the confusion between, um, you know, consumerism and capitalism and opinion and quality is, Intentional and complex, but I think we'd all benefit from just a little bit more pragmatic, uh, empirical, standardized, science-like approach to some of these things when it really matters, Um, because it could be a a significant portion of your budget uh, or whatever. And in in, in the opposite case, you might decide that it really doesn't matter (laughs) Um, for, for, for particular things in your life, and you don't have to have the best of everything. Wow, that was fun. Um, I didn't realize uh, how how important this was to me. It's kind of one of those things I've thought about hard and long, and just sort of put it back in the back shelf of my mind, and I haven't pulled it out in a while. Um, so I hope I hope um, hope that stimulated your curiosity a little bit, and I hope that uh, gave you some food for thought. Maybe you know, at the very least, a way to help yourself fall asleep on one of those nights instead of counting sheep. Um, and so, yeah. This has been Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom, episode 30, Quality. Look for me on the DJ Doran Show if you're interested in that. And he's, you know, he, he does some wonderful podcasting, and I recommend that you check his show out. Um, you can find him on Facebook and at www.djduran.com. And look for a future KEW series on curiosity. If you know somebody in your life that you think might be interested in what I'm doing, please share it with them because it's the only way I have to get in front of people. And I appreciate all the help that you guys are giving me. Anyway, until next time, I'm Chris Bircher, Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. Thanks for being curious and thanks for your time. See you next week.